When I first met Taylor, he was um, the weekend manager at Groucho's, and I had just moved to Columbia. It was about six or seven years later <laughs> that uh, we were like, okay, now is the time to really settle down and um, grow up. Eventually, um, the band going, taking a hiatus, uh, me moving back to Columbia um, to be near Sally, um, and that's when I started going to Shandon. We met um, one of my favorite people, uh, Steve Turner. Um, he really played a significant role um, in our development uh, as, as a couple feeling convicted to leave some of most of my past in the in the past um, in 2020 um, I gave gave up drinking um, and then when my son was born um, in 2022 um, I stopped using all other substances our faith has really been the foundation for what has grown into be our family where we are now um, and I just I just see like so much more peace in you in your life now that um, you've put God as your main focus um, instead of the world and I just like I'm just so proud I know that I would not be where I am at today um, if it weren't for you and your relentless um, just love and caring um, for me, especially in the dark times and when I was at my lowest. Looking back, I think um, that I am a living example of God's faithfulness. He let, he allowed me to go through all of the difficult times um, because he knew how the story would end. Yeah, and I think that's all because of his immense love for me. The mercy of God, thank you, Taylor. Hey, if you have your Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, as we continue our series, Stories of Compassion Through the Life of David, and this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, God uses the unlikely. God uses the unlikely. I remember hearing the story of Adrian Rogers, the great preacher of yesteryear. He was preaching at a conference of pastors, and he asked the question. He says, if any of you, at one point, you were the valedictorian or the salutedictorian, would you please stand at this time? And there were those in the room, a few who who stood up, it was a room of about three, 4,000 people. He says, what, what about you who are on the dean's list? If you were on the dean's list at some point, would you stand? And, and a few other people began to stand. And then he said, what about the honor roll list? At some point in your life, maybe in elementary school or middle school, high school, if you were on the honor roll, would you stand? And then he asked the question, if you've been on a 40 under 40 type of list, would you stand as well? A few others began to stand. And, and then he made the point. He said, there's good news and there's bad news. He said, the good news is that God can still use those of you who are standing. He said, the bad news is that God typically doesn't choose you. He chooses the unimpressive or the unlikely. And so if you are never on any of those lists, there's good news this morning. God can use you. That's what we're going to see from 1 Samuel chapter 16 today. This is a lesson for us all. It's a lesson that God works even in seasons of obscurity when we feel forgotten and unseen. God does his best work in the hidden places. It's in the blank spaces of life where our character is formed. Here's the thought for you today. Long before God sends us to the palaces, God shapes us in the pastures. Are you going through a season right now where you're in a pasture? It's a time of obscurity and monotony. You're just going through the merry-go-realm of normality. Life just seems so mundane. 
And God wants to use this season where it seems like you're hidden and God wants to prepare you for something great. You know, as we look throughout the Old Testament, we'll see a lot of these stories where God uses seasons of obscurity, the hiddenness of life. Take, for example, Moses. Moses, that sure, he grew up in the palace there of Egypt, but he would go to the backside of the desert where for 40 years that he would live in Midian. But God was going to use those 40 years of service to prepare him to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. I think about the life of Joseph. We love Joseph. Sure, he was a fan favorite for his family, but then Joseph was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused. He was able to interpret some dreams, but then he waited another two years waiting for someone to come back. But God was preparing all in him during that period, the character that he needed. Or I think about Esther. Esther, as God used her in her obscurity, she concealed her identity, but then God used her to save the people of Israel, the Jews. Throughout church history, throughout the Old Testament, we see this truth, that waiting times are not wasted times. What about for you today? Are you in that waiting period of life? God wants to use this period. God uses the unlikely. So let's look here at 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says this. The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected for myself a king from his sons. Samuel asked, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord answered, take a young cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will let you know what you are to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate to you. Samuel did what the Lord directed and went to Bethlehem. When the elders of the town met him, they trembled and asked, do you come in peace? In peace, he replied, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to, to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and said, certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. The Lord hasn't chosen this one either, Samuel said. Then Jesse presented Shema, but Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. After Jesse presented seven of his sons to him, Samuel told Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And Samuel asked him, are there... Are these all the sons you have? This is still the youngest, he answered, but right now he's tending the sheep, Samuel told Jesse. Send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He had beautiful eyes and a healthy, handsome appearance. And the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. Then Samuel set out and went to Ramah. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, I pray today that you might encourage a heart in here today who thinks that they cannot be used of you. Lord, there's no one beyond your grace. Lord, you continue to open up doors of opportunity. So in these seasons of obscurity, in the anonymity of life, God, how we pray that you would use us to accomplish the purposes that you have we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to give you five principles of how God uses the unlikely. Perhaps that is you today. You say, I feel like I'm unlikely to be used of the Lord. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Here's the first thing that I want you to see from our text. God's plans are bigger than your problems. God's plans are bigger so many of you remember, if you were here last week, how the story ended. First Samuel chapter 8. The people, they demand a king. They want a king. The problem is that they wanted the wrong kind of king. 
God says, you can have a king, but you've got to wait for the king that I have for you. But instead, the people of Israel, they said, no, we want a king right now. And this presents a truth for us. What we want is not always what we need. Ungodly desires satisfy in the present, but they do not shape us for the long-term need. So God says to Samuel the prophet, he says, stop mourning, for I've rejected Saul as king. Get up and go. That could be you today. Some of you, you're remembering your past, your failures, all the problems that you have walked through in life. And you're having one of these Saul type of moments. Could God ever use me? God's plan for Israel didn't fail. Saul may have failed. Saul was disobedient. Saul didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. But God wants to remind you this truth today. Your failure is not final. Your failure is not final. Let me prove that to you. In Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul Now, if you know anything about Paul, you know that he grew up as a religious leader. He was trained under Gamaliel. He had one of the greatest educations of his day. And in the early part of his life, he persecuted Christians. He was the one torturing Christians, and yet God radically saved him on the Damascus Road. And Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press forward, I reach forward, and I pursue as my goal, my goal the heavenly calling that I've received in Christ Jesus. Notice that Paul said this one thing I do. He was focused on the Lord. I meet many people today, they can't say this one thing I do. Instead, they'll say these many things that I dabble in. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Remember, his behind was persecuting Christians. In the past, he was the one that was hurting Christians. And he says, I'm no longer focused on the past. Paul didn't have spiritual amnesia. He says, I'm just choosing not to focus on the past because I'm looking forward to what God has for me in the present. For some of you today, you're remembering your past and that's keeping you from what God has for you in the future. There's no one so bad that he cannot be saved and no one so good he need not to be saved. As someone has said, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. God's plans are bigger than your problems. Here in our text, 1 Samuel 16, that God says to Samuel, stop mourning over Saul, get up and go. But I love this next point. Character is more important than charisma. Do you believe that today, that character is more important than charisma? You see, when Samuel arrives, Jesse, he starts to line up all of his sons. And the first one was impressive. His name was Eliab. Eliab looked the part. In fact, when Samuel saw him, he says, surely this is the one that the Lord has anointed. But this is a reminder for us today that although someone may look like a king on the outside doesn't mean that they have a king's heart on the inside. Man is constantly looking out the outward appearance, but it is God that looks at the heart. What about for you today? Are you looking at the outward appearance of others or are you focused on the heart? See, here's what God knows. What we need is not to be more impressive. Our greatest problem was not that we are not good looking, or our greatest problem is not that we don't have the right IQ. Our greatest problem is sin and disobedience. So God was going to send the right type of king. Don't look for your security and hope in the things of this world. Rather, focus on the things of God, and it starts with character. When God looks for leaders, God is not valuing the things that man values. Here's the principle. God is not looking for human potential. He's looking for humble dependence. God prioritizes character over charisma. I think there are several applications for us today. One application would be in your work as you're looking for employees in your business. Don't just go for that person that seems impressive. Someone who can get the job done, someone who can make you a lot of money. Instead, look for the person of character. 
Or how about if you're single but you're looking to date someone? And you say, well, that's the person that I want to marry. It was love at first sight. That is horrible wisdom. Instead, look at the heart. You know, who knows? That person could be uh, overly compulsive. That person could have no integrity. No, we should look on the inside at the heart is what ultimately matters. Or how about this? Let God form your character first. I could pose it to you in this question. Is the person that you're looking for, is the person that you are looking currently at who you would want to be, or I could phrase it this way. Are you the person that the person you are looking for is looking for? I was reading an article not long ago by David Brooks from the New York Times, and he talked about the difference between eulogy virtues and resume virtues. You say, what's the difference between a eulogy and a resume virtue? Well, a lot of us focus on resume virtues, someone who can get the job done, someone who is impressive. But when you have your celebration of life service one day, no one's gonna talk about how great of a company that you built. They're gonna talk about your character, who you were on the inside. They're gonna talk about how kind and compassionate you are to others. You see, what I'm trying to show you today is that character ultimately matters. I've mentioned to you before but that reputation is what man thinks that you are, but character is what God knows that you are. God uses nobodies. If you believe that, would you say amen? God uses nobodies. But God uses a particular kind of nobody. It's a nobody that's in pursuit of him. See, we see from David's life, we can see that he was a man of character. I want to show you from David's life that there are at least four attributes related to character. If you want to be a person of character, you need these in your life. Number one, to be spiritually mature. Notice that I did not say spiritual perfection. I said spiritually mature. David is the only person that the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart, and two times the Bible says that about David. Now, David certainly had his flaws and his failures, but he was a man after God's own heart. David wrote the 23rd Psalm. If you're going to write the 23rd Psalm, you have to have a walk with the Lord that you are spiritually mature. David was not perfect, but he was spiritually mature. There's something else that I want you to see about David's life, that he was full of humility. Here's how I know that. When David was anointed as king, we're going to see that in the story here in just a moment. He waited for nearly 10 years. It could have been up to 15 years before he took the kingship. 15 years of a blank space in life, a hidden time in his life where he's just there in the pasture. David didn't take a business card and say, hey, I'm going to go to the Jerusalem Times and have them to mark out shepherd and now put king elect. Instead, he was humble. He waited. The pathway to greatness has the first step of humility. Humility, as we've said before, is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's to be humble. Humility chooses service over spotlight. There, there's many people who want the spotlight today, but what about service? Jesus said there in Mark 10, 45, that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The greatness of an individual is their willingness to do for others who in return cannot do anything for them. If you want to see greatness in the kingdom of God, it's to be someone that's humble, that's full of service. I'll tell you another characteristic of, of a person of integrity is that they have conviction. David was a man of conviction. He did not go to and from easily. He wasn't tossed by the winds and the waves. If you're not going to bend to pressure, you've got to rise above that with conviction. But listen to me carefully today. You have to have the right type of conviction. Not just a conviction that you determine of yourself. It must be biblical conviction. Let me give you a definition for biblical conviction. Biblical convictions are not just beliefs that we hold, they are truths 
that hold us. Here's another characteristic. Not only being spiritually mature, humility, conviction, but also integrity. Do you know that two times in his life that David had the opportunity to kill Saul, Saul was on the run, David was there in a cave, but he said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Now, yes, we know about the failures that David would have with Bathsheba that included Uriah the Hittite, but David was a man for most of his life that had integrity. And here's what integrity is. Integrity is who you are when the lights go off and the crowd is gone. Integrity is who you are when no one is looking. Character is more important than charisma. We see this in the life of David as well, that God uses the most unlikely people to accomplish his most important plans. I want you to look at verse 7. Notice what the Bible says here. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for human sees what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. In verse 11, and Samuel asked him, are these all the sons you have? Now, I must admit that I somewhat identify with Jesse in this moment. Are these all the sons that, that you have? When we just had one, Conrad, our oldest, I mean, it was easy to, to watch over him. We only had one to take care of. But now we have four in, in the family, and I think our middle daughter sometimes, they have what you have, middle child syndrome. Does anybody else suffer from that? It's a, it's a real thing. So, so let, me, let me explain it to you. When, when Conrad was a baby, I mean, we would take all of these pictures. Our photo roll on our phone was filled with pictures of Conrad. I mean, his first 10 tries at a first step. We, we took pictures and videos. And then Kessid came along, and it was only the, the first step that we would video. You know, we, we were just waiting for that moment. And then Carolina came, and with Conrad, we would, you know, take all of the first day of preschool pictures. I think we just had a few with, with Carolina. And then Callie Jane, our youngest, she turned one yesterday, and Cassie was asking. She says, hey, do we have any photos of, of Callie Jane. Now, I'm kidding when I say that. Cassie wants me to know, wants you to know that I'm somewhat embellishing that, but you get the point here. You know, with the oldest, you, you had all of this care and attention. Well, here comes David. David is the youngest. In fact, here in verse 11, it says that he, he's the youngest. It's the Hebrew word hakaton. Can you say that hakaton? Sounds kind of harsh. That, that word hakaton here in verse 11, it doesn't just mean unimpressive or young. It, it means that you are the runt. He says, oh, by the way, yes, there's one more. He's the runt of the family. But certainly God wouldn't use him. He's just a shepherd boy. God uses the unlikely. See, here's how we differ from, from, from God. We tend to focus on what's flashy, but God is drawn to what is faithful. We see this throughout the Bible. I've already mentioned the story of Joseph. I've mentioned to you the story of Moses, but how about Gideon? Gideon there in the Old Testament, he was the weakest of his family, and he was of the weakest tribe of Israel, and yet God would use Gideon. Or how about the disciples? They were a group of ragtag individuals. They were not the sharpest tool in the shed or the brightest crayon in the box. I mean, the disciples were not the best. They were fishermen from Galilee. And yet by the year 300 AD, that they had turned the world upside down because of their faithfulness to the Lord. God uses those that seem unlikely. But it's not just in the scriptures. How about the father of the modern missions movement, William Carey? He was a poor shoemaker. He came from humble beginnings, and God would use him to influence millions for the sake of the gospel. Then there's Dwight L. Moody, who turned America back to God. Oh, by the way, with Dwight L. Moody, he couldn't capitalize his own name, and did you know that he couldn't write his name when he first started in the ministry? I think about Billy Graham. There was nothing outwardly impressive about Billy Graham, but there was a heart that was devoted to God. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is God is not looking on the outside. God is looking on the inside. If you were unimpressive, 
If you say, I couldn't be used, you are a prime candidate for God to use you. So often that we listen to the the words of our enemy and we think, God could never use me. Listen, your weakness is God's platform to show off his power. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the thorn in the side of his flesh. He says that he had these disabilities And then God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect through weakness. What you see as an inability and a liability is actually an opportunity. God doesn't need your strength. What God needs is your surrender. He doesn't need you to have all the answers because he has all the answers. So let me apply this in three ways today. Maybe you say, my life right now doesn't seem very impressive. It's just the mundane patterns of life. Let me speak to those moms who are out there today. You say that my life is right now nothing but changing diapers and caring for a young child. Hey, that's important work. That's the most important Work. You are caring for someone that is made in the image of God. So don't let the enemy say that you're in an unimpressive season in life. Instead, God is using you to shape the world. A mother's faith-filled example is the greatest sermon that her children will ever hear. God uses the prayers of a godly mom. Or how about that person here today that you're an employee You say, I'm working a dead-end job. My life seems unimpressive right now. Did you know that God can shape his kingdom in the future in that dead-end job that you're in? Don't look at this as unimpressive. Instead, you faithfully serve. Your integrity in the workplace is a reflection of your faith, not just your performance. Or maybe you say that I'm just going through, again, this season of life that seems mundane. Maybe that you've been single for several years. And by the way, God calls some to a lifetime of singleness. And if God calls you to a lifetime of singleness, then use that for the glory of God and serve him. But maybe you you say, I'm just waiting. I'm in this holding pattern of life. And I'm in this season of singleness. What God would say to us today is, in the season of singleness, God isn't withholding blessings. He's preparing your heart to carry them well. So even in the mundane, the everyday, the merry-go-round of normality, God is using these unlikely moments to go about accomplishing his great ends. There's something else I want you to see today, and that's this. God prepares us in obscurity, so don't waste your pasture. Paul didn't waste his pasture or his desert moment. You know, the story there that Paul is sent into Arabia for three and a half years. I believe that Paul is likely, other than Jesus, one of the most influential, if not the most influential person in human history. I mean, he's written more of the New Testament than any one individual. Did you know that after God radically saved Paul, that he sent him away for three and a half years there in the desert to learn the mind of God? It's there in Arabia where he would learn about justification by faith alone that he could write the book of Romans. Don't waste your pasture. Chuck Swindoll, who recently retired, a great Bible teacher, in commentating on this passage, he said there are three key words that you need to know, and I want you to write them down. Here are the words. Obscurity, monotony, in reality. See, we must see that obscurity is not a setback, but a setup. That God uses it to build the character you'll need for your future calling. Obscurity. Maybe like David, you're in this season of obscurity. It seems like you're anonymous to those around you that no one knows Now, many of you have heard the name Charles Spurgeon before. I've talked to you about Spurgeon. He was what's known as the Prince of Preachers. But in that same time period, he had a contemporary named Alexander McLaren. He was known as the Prince of Expositors. Uh, 
And Alexander McLaren said this about ministry. He said that there are many people that they give away their early days of ministry because they're frittering around focused on other things rather than the one thing that God has called them to. What about for you? Maybe you're in this season of obscurity and God would say, listen, focus on me, obscurity. Not only obscurity, but also monotony. Can you think about David in this moment? Someone's probably like, hey, David, what are you doing today? He says, I'm practicing a sling with my slingshot. Oh, by the way, the slingshot that he would need in order to defeat Goliath, that giant. Or someone says, hey, David, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm just writing another song, another psalm. It was probably in this period that he's writing the 23rd Psalm, which is one of the greatest of all times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul for his name's sake. And even when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, it was in that time of monotony that David could say, even when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, that I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare before me in the presence of my enemies a table. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. In that season of monotony, God can use you if you'll be devoted to him. Not only monotony, Swindoll says reality. How about that courage that David would need, where David would fight off the lion and the bear? Where did he learn that? He learned it in his pasture. Or how about that humility that he would need in order to go on to be the greatest king in Israel? Where did he learn that? He learned that in the pasture. You see, folks, what I'm trying to tell you today is even in the small things, God is using you, preparing you for a greater moment, or I could put it this way, faithfulness in the small sets the patterns for faithfulness in the big. Isn't that what Jesus told us? If you'll be faithful in little, then I can give you more. So in your pasture moment, I don't know what that is for you, but what I'm telling you is don't waste that moment because God wants to prepare you for future faithfulness but you've got to be faithful now. David was young. But let me apply this in a couple ways to those who are young here today. Maybe for those who are in high school today, or you're a student, maybe you're in middle school. I would say a couple things to this. First of all, when it comes to your schoolwork, that's important. It's not that it's unimportant. Be faithful in the small. Be faithful in the small now so that God can use you to bigger things later? Or how about when it comes to purity? If you would pursue purity now, then God can use you in, in great ways in the future. You know, I think about 1 Corinthians 6, which it says, honor God with your bodies. I think everyone needs to hear that, that from the youngest to the oldest. Let's be faithful now. Or how about with your walk with God? You say, hey, there'll be a day when I'll start to have a quiet time with, with the Lord. There'll be a day later when I'll start to pray more diligently. No, don't wait for that day. It's today. Get into the word now. Or maybe you would say, well, what about in, in another area? I would say be faithful to your friends now. If you'll be faithful now, you can be faithful as a friend later. Your obedience to your parents now is a big deal. In this season of obscurity, don't waste it. But I want you to see one last truth here from 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I love this. David is not the hero of the story. Jesus is. Well, let me prove it to you. So there are a lot of similarities between David in this story and what we learn about Jesus. You remember David, he came from humble beginnings. He was there in Bethlehem. We've learned some about Bethlehem. This was where Ruth and Boaz were, were from. Micah 5.2 would tell us that Bethlehem is where the Messiah Jesus would one day come from. But here David, he's out in the pasture. Did you know that your Lord Jesus, that he didn't have room in an inn, instead he had to go to a humble manger? There's the humility part. There's, there's some semblance there. Not only that, how about the, the anointing of the Spirit of God? Do you remember early in Jesus' ministry where it says that the Spirit 
descended upon him like a dove there at John's baptism. Now, the spirit would never depart from Jesus. He's the, the son of God. But you see, there's some similarities there as well. In fact, the same word that's used for Messiah, Jesus Messiah, the Hebrew word is anointed that we see here in 1 Samuel 16. There's some similarities. Do you know that both David and Jesus, they were abandoned? Uh, David, he would go 15 years where he would have to be humble before he could take the kingship. Jesus, 33 years, his, when he came, Jesus was the son of God, and yet he humbly waited. But Jesus would be abandoned too. There by the, the Jewish leaders, he was the stone that the, the builders rejected. But here's the good news. Jesus was abandoned so that you wouldn't have to be. Whereas Jesus, he went to the cross so you wouldn't have to. Jesus, he rose from the grave so that you could have victory forever through the grave. Jesus is greater than David. This story is ultimately not just about David. It's about how through David we see the ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, who was a man after God's own heart. Because the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. So here's the truth, church family. If you feel forgotten, unseen in your season of obscurity, if you're in a pasture moment today, don't waste it. God still has a plan for you. Better yet, if you don't know Jesus, Jesus is the greater David. Come to Jesus today because Jesus, he saves. He's the king that Israel ultimately was looking for. Now here in just a moment, we're gonna pray together. We're gonna sing, but I just... I believe this, when we were praying as a staff this week, I was just praying, God, if you're calling someone into ministry, now all of us are, are ministers of the gospel, but maybe someone to use their life as a missionary or maybe as a, as a pastor, I've just been praying this week that for that person that's discouraged by their inabilities, that you wouldn't let Satan whisper into your ear, hey, you can't be used of God, but instead you would just step forward and you say, hey, I want to use my life for the sake of Jesus. I want to be focused on the one thing, not dabbling in many things. I want to be focused on the one thing, forgetting what is behind and pressing forward to what is ahead. So here in just a moment, we're going to sing together. We're going to pray. But if God is working in your heart this morning, we're going to have folks here, part of our team, that want to pray with you. We want to be able to, to encourage you that God can use you that God wants to use you, that God is willing to use you. So I'm gonna pray for us here, then we're gonna sing and respond. Don't waste your pasture. Lord, we thank you for 1 Samuel chapter 16, the life of David. And Lord, we thank you that our failure is not final. Lord, we thank you that long before we step into the palaces, that you shape us in the pasture. And so, Lord, today I pray that you would move. Lord, I pray that we would respond to you, all that we are, responding to all that you are. Lord, we thank you that you don't give up on us. Lord, I pray that the person that's here today that feels as if you've perhaps given up, Lord, that you would remind them that your grace is sufficient. There is no one that is too far. So, Lord, I pray today, Lord, that you would be at work as we respond, as we move. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Church family, would you stand as we come, as we sing, would you respond?